Why do we study the history books? Why do we study the American Revolution or the Civil War? It's because we learn from the past. We learn from our history, and we are our history. Korean Americans are part of this, this American society, American fabric, and they have a story to tell. If we don't know where we came from, chances are when we are living in here, we are going to lost. That, that's you and Rod and Joyce, Paul Head and Yes, Joyce. I forgot. That's you. That's been 70 years ago, you know, 50 years ago, hmm? Huh? I never saw these before. Yes, you did. I did? She <laughs> hey, hey. This is Harry Pock. He was born in 1918 during World War I. You guys saw these pictures before, huh? I don't remember. Harry's father, Kyung Soo Pak, was one of the very first Korean pioneers. Drawn to the fertile farmlands of the Pacific Northwest, like the earlier immigrants of the Oregon Trail, Kyung Soo Pak settled in the shadow of Mount Hood to start a farm and raise a family. The original group of Korean pioneers made their first passage halfway across the Pacific to Hawaii in 1903 to work the sugarcane plantations. Mostly young laboring men, they saved until they could afford to send for wives and families. Eventually, they would complete the second leg across the Pacific, arriving to the west coast like the Chinese and Japanese before, to take hard manual labor jobs in laundry, restaurants, groceries, and, like Harry Pock's father, agriculture. One of the very first Korean-American pioneers, Harry Pock's father begins farming in 1904. He works and saves, and 10 years later, in 1914, he is joined by his wife, So Saim. At this time, their Korean homeland has been officially annexed by Japan. The passport that Harry's mother hands the customs clerk is written in Japanese, issued by the imperial government of Japan. In an attempt to avoid the anti-Asian immigration policy of the U.S., such as the Chinese Exclusion Act, Japan halts Korean immigration and allows only brides passage to join husbands already in the States. Many other brides that arrive at this time are picture brides. All the ladies are here, is there all picture brides. Because men working in uh, sugar cane in Hawaii doesn't make that much money to go over there to Korea to pick a wife up. No way. Picture brides are often young women escaping the hardships of Japanese-occupied Korea. In an attempt for a better life, they accept the gamble of marrying a man, often much older, whom they had only seen in a snapshot sent from the States. My great-uncle great, uh, was about 26 years older than my aunt was. But when he was a young man, about 33, 35, perfect very handsome looking guy, but my aunt was only 16 years old. The picture brides would get off the dock and see the older man she was to marry instead of the young man in the picture, but by then her fate had been cast. She could not turn back to Korea, not for the shame it would bring her family from a failed marriage, and not to resume a life under the hardship of Japanese occupation. In 
Korea. During occupation, Japan orders Korean citizens to worship Shinto shrines, adopt Japanese names, and forbids them to speak their native language. In an uprising for independence, 7,000 protesters are killed. At least 30,000 more are imprisoned. Many Koreans cast off across the Pacific, now drifters without a country. In 1914, Sosaim arrived to join her husband and raise a family, to make a life independent of Japanese occupation. Sosaim gives birth to Jackson, Arthur, Harry, and Gilbert. But in 1925, she dies in childbirth. Unable to raise the children alone, the widowed Kyung Su Pak moves the family to Idaho to be with relatives. Though the Great Depression hits American cities and the Dust Bowl blows across the Great Plains, the Korean settlers forge ahead, scraping out a living farming. It is a simple life of hard work, regular as seasons, American as anything else. With American attention turned to Europe, the Japanese Empire continues its pattern of invasion and conquest, spreading far beyond the homeland of Korea into the Pacific, until it accumulates one Sunday morning in December 1941. After Pearl Harbor, Pacific Coast Japanese Americans are shipped by train hundreds of miles inland to relocation camps. Businesses and farms are left vacant or are repossessed by the U.S. government. In the absence of the Japanese Americans, anti-Asian prejudice, fueled by the war, turns on the Koreans. Little kids don't know Japanese or Korean or, you know, Chinese and Korean goes out to the street. They throw a stone and say, hey, Jap, you know, kind of thing. To prove their loyalty to America, many Koreans go to work in the war industry, buy war bonds, or join the military. Harry Pak and his brothers, now grown up into their late teens, are strong, hard-working farm boys, like thousands of their generation eager to enlist in World War II. Harry remains on the farm to help his dad, but three of his brothers sign up and ship off. Jackson, a combat pilot, does not come back. With the surrender of Japan in 1945, the Allies hastily divided Korea in half along the 38th parallel as a temporary solution to facilitate the surrender of Japanese forces. The U.S. managed the south of Korea, while the Soviet Union took the north. Each superpower established temporary governments until Korea could be united as a sovereign nation. And American life, for the most part, relaxed to enjoy post-war peace and prosperity. In Korea, with the end of Japanese occupation, a young student named Rok Soon prepares to cross the Pacific to study nursing. During occupation, she had been forced to speak Japanese, take a Japanese name, and labor for the Imperial Army. We grew up as all Japanese culture. You know, their culture, their history, 
even the sewing, uh, we never uh, sew like this. It's all the Japanese kimono to sew in the sewing class. And even food is not typical Korean food, it's all Japanese style. They really turned us, if, if another 50 years, probably we became one. After crossing the Pacific in 1949, Roxoon moves in with her great aunt, but only after one year finds that she cannot return to Korea. But there was worse to come. A highly trained and well-equipped North Korean army swarmed across the 38th parallel to attack unprepared South Korean defenders. Caught off guard, they were all but overwhelmed until the United Nations took its historic vote to intervene. Rock Soon cannot return to her hometown, now a battle zone. Yet she cannot legally stay in the U.S. because her student visa will expire. Her aunt advises her to marry the charismatic Harry Park whom she had occasionally seen at dinner parties among the tight-knit Korean community. Uh, my birthday was August 31st, so my great-aunt had a birthday party for me. He run around with all these gals, you know, all these gals and make them laugh and then joking things and... Was, so I figured, oh, maybe he's okay. Shortly after the start of the Korean War, Harry and Roxoon marry in 1951. When were you married? Fifth of May. Fifth of May. We close. We close. <laughs> Fifth of May in 1951. Roxoon's aunt, who had arrived a generation before as a 16-year-old picture bride, attends as the maid of honor. Standing side by side in the wedding photos, represented two very different generations, the end of the first wave of Korean immigration and the beginning of the second. I was 17 years old when I got on the ship to go over, and I was 18 when I got off in Busan. Busan was the congregation point, I'm sure, for hundreds of thousands of refugees who had pushed, been pushed from the north all the way down from Seoul, Tegu, Taejeon, the, the major cities to the north, all the way down into the Busan area. When North Korea invaded the south in 1950, they pushed down the length of the peninsula, nearly to the southern tip, to the seaport of Busan. Chuck Lasardi, an American GI, was shipped to Korea to repel the communist forces. From Pusan, they moved north. Troops coming up, you'd look at the young one, young, they're all young. They don't, you don't think of that when you're that young yourself. You're all the same age. And as they're coming up, uh, you can see their looks of, you know, quiet concern, like, what is this place? Where am I going? What am I going to do? And all of them, on more than one occasion, you know, felt a, a twinge of, is it all worth it? You know, what, what's going on here? Who would do such a thing to create so much, you know, so much trouble and so much pain and suffering for so many people? And that was pathetic. I, the people, the women, the, uh, the old, old women, the young women, the little young girls, young boys with little ones on their back. You knew they didn't have enough to eat. Whatever they had to eat was what they were carrying with them. They may have had family members somewhere, but nobody could find anybody, which left an awful lot of children who were seemingly without anybody. You stop in these villages where essentially there's nothing there. And the minute you stop your truck to you know, open a can of sea rations or uh, relieve yourself, and out of the ground comes kids like gophers coming out of the ground. Little ones, I mean three, four years old. And you say, well, man, it makes you want to cry.
He said, you know, you want to take them with you. You want to do something, but you're going the wrong way. But standing there and looking at that individual, standing just a few feet from you and being so hopelessly helpless that you can't, there's no way you can reach out and touch them in a fashion that will do anything significant for their life for more than an instant. That is, uh, I'm not an emotional person most of the time. I can, I think I can take quite a bit. But uh, that chokes me out. I saw the airplane coming over. I saw a lot of, like a, a bottle of uh, beer, black bottle of beer coming from the airplane in a, maybe hundreds of them, just uh, coming down, just devastated our hometown. My house was about the uh, 50, maybe maximum 100 feet away from that area. So we were able to survive without that uh, casualty on, of the bombings. But my friends, whole family, they completely gone. I was fleeing outside from the town, and then uh, I saw many people you know, no hands and the legs and some of them bleeding. A lot of people came out from the town. I still remember all of those things. John Im was only 14 when the Korean War broke out. His father was the chief fireman in Yaju, just outside of Seoul, only miles from the battle zone of the 38th parallel. When the North Korean came over, they killed many South Korean and that they're thinking they were the collaborator with the South Korean government and American spies. When the South Korean soldiers went to the North Korean, they killed a lot of North Korean, thinking they are communist, maybe some of them are. So when they are moving back and forth, always a lot of people has been killed. My father was one of the, the earliest casualty in the Korean War. It was the war time, they just took him, and a week or two weeks later, they just shot him. Without conviction, without trial, without notifying the family. It was not my father alone, there are about the hundreds of other people. So, you know, what can I say, <laughs> you know, so. During the high school, I was a sick boy. I was uh, stricken by tuberculosis. Tuberculosis has been a rampant in Korea, and I was almost at the verge of death. I talked to my mom, and mom gave me uh, two chickens. And so I took it to the marketplace, and I sold it for my uh, travel expenses. Out of that, I was able to go the uh, DMZ 9th Corps, and I waited about yeah, two weeks, and then finally they hired me as a houseboy. Well, one of the unique things in the Korean War, or I think of it as unique to the Korean War, was the houseboy, because they were the young, young men, young boys, really, uh, not of military age, who were in need of food and clothing, and they would be picked up by um, GI military units uh, and set up as what we euphemistically called houseboys. And he was usually uh, dressed in modified military attire, fatigues, and he would be, he would look like a little miniature soldier and uh, they lavished much on their houseboys just as they would on their children. So it was a unique position to have, and uh, one that was really a lot of them were vying for. Houseboy is cleaning the tent and the uh, shoe shining, or any errand uh, they ask me to do, 
and the cleaning in the winter time, cleaning the oil stove, which just get dirty easily, and also uh, whatever they ask me to do. I did work as a houseboy for about a year. They paid me $15 a month, but it was a great opportunity for me at the time, learning American way of life, uh, that they're learning English. It has been a cherished moment in my life. It is a defining moment for me. The war had ravished the landscape and devastated the Korean population. It claimed over two million civilian casualties, many of them women and children. Of all the U.S. troops serving in the Korean War, less than 1% were female. Many American GIs met and married Korean women. The first wave of Korean wives had arrived in the early years of Japanese occupation as picture brides. This second wave came as GI war brides. Eleven war brides, ten Korean and one Chinese, but all from Korea, arrive in California with their husbands. It's a happy homecoming for all concerned, a new home far from the terrors of battle-scarred lands. Three of the couples bring their blessed events with them. From 1951 through 1964, 28,000 Korean women immigrated as war brides. Love is international, and here is definite proof. The outgrowth of the Korean War was a, uh, a significant wave of immigration based upon American compassion, a, a compassion that expressed itself in, we've got more than we can ever use, come join us at our table. And a lot of the Korean people were ready to make that transition. With the returning GIs, news of the Korean War's effect filters back to the U.S. In rural Oregon, one couple, Harry and Bertha Holt, watch a documentary film about children orphaned as a result of the Korean War. There certainly had been other wars. So it was the uh, vision of Mr. and Mrs. Holt who saw a film and, and they were incredibly moved by what was happening to children in Korea. And what they knew was that children belonged in families. The Holts already had six children of their own, but decided to adopt eight from Korea. Portland's International Airport, October 1955. His wife, friends, neighbors have come to welcome home an Oregon farmer. Harry Holt returns from Korea and brings back as his own eight war orphans. Seeing firsthand the large-scale need for adoption following the war, they decide to do even more. Harry leaves for Korea while Bertha heads a campaign to get international adoption legalized by Congress. In addition to taking care of their family and farm in Cresswell, Oregon, the Holtz begin the first large-scale international adoption program. When Korean adoption first began, it was an extraordinary social happening. It had never been done before. Children from one country had never immigrated to another in, for the purpose of adoption from one race to another, one ethnicity to another. And there was a great deal of concern about what would happen to these children and how would they fit in. And so my parents, along with the parents at that time, were told, you must Americanize your child as quickly as possible. Uh, the concern about fitting in was given priority over um, connection to birth, country, and culture. We came as children. We came as babies. We weren't the typical immigrant that came as a grown-up. We came to a family, and it was the deliberate choice of our parents to bring us. And so we didn't immigrate here because we wanted to come. We immigrated here because adults wanted to bring us here. She arrived in 1956 as a four-year-old. Her Korean birth mother had named her Soon Kyum, or Pure Gold. 
Her new American adoptive family called her Susan. She was born during the war to a Korean woman and an American GI. There was no possibility for me to really have a good life in Korea, given the circumstances that my mother was Korean and my father was not. And that simple fact would have followed me always. It was the stigma of, of orphan as well as the stigma of being mixed race. Susan grew up in a small rural town. Her parents also adopted a Korean son. Susan and her adoptive brother were the only non-Caucasian residents. I didn't feel different. I felt um, I was much more American by osmosis because that's what I knew from day-to-day -day living. I was always aware that I looked different. When you're looking out, you don't see those differences. It's people looking at you that recognize them and generally feel um, pretty open about just pointing it out to you as if somehow you didn't know that. She grew up like any other American kid. She was even crowned a dairy princess in high school. I grew up in a, in a tiny little town. I mean, there were 500 people in the whole community. I didn't meet another adoptee until I was 17 years old. In a very short period of time, we knew each other better than childhood friends that I had known as long as I could remember. And it was based on this common experience that was so deeply profound and, and felt by both of us. And, you know, we were both very happy, I would say well-adjusted 17-year-olds, but it was the, did you ever feel this? Did this ever happen to you? Kind of conversations that we'd never had with anyone else or even known that there was a longing for. Even after half a century of Korean immigration, the community is extremely small and isolated. There are few Korean stores, churches, or organized cultural groups. The passage of the Heart Seller Act in 1965 opens the door to Asian immigrants of skilled labor, students, and professionals seeking economic prosperity in the U.S., bringing the third wave of Pacific pioneers to American shores. Early each morning, down at the port of Portland, a Korean man of unassuming stature is seen lingering, looking for ships from Asia. The Korean man, a Presbyterian pastor, would approach the Asian sailors and offer to hold a service, take them sightseeing, or back to his house for a home-cooked meal. The sailors, stuck at port while their ships loaded cargo, were eager to take him up on his offer. Reverend Sung Chung Kim was originally from North Korea. During the war, his family fled to the south, walking the entire length of the peninsula on foot. In the spring of 1959, Pastor Kim meets his future wife in Pusan. The meeting was arranged by a matchmaker. Over the course of the summer, Kim sends her love letters and eventually convinces her to marry him. The two wed that fall. They had only seen each other once before their wedding. In 1961, Pastor Kim arrives in America to study theology. His wife later joins him. Between Pastor Kim's sermons, driving, and job instruction, as well as his wife's cooking and support, the two pioneer a rather unique Korean ministry. Korean ministry. 
그다음에 학교 타는 거 문제 되면은 운전을 해야 되는데 운전을 하려면 운전 퍼미트 하는 거 드라이빙 테스트 하는 거 차, 차를 사야 되는 거 그걸 전부 내가 데리고 다니면서 통역을 하면서 설명을 하면서 하기 때문에 심지어는 이게 DMV에 가게 되면 지금도 너 옛날에 사람 많이 데리고 와서 통역했지. <웃음> In the years of his ministry, Pastor Kim helped over 2,000 people from Korea find jobs and housing. Each morning, he'd get up early. His wife would pack sack lunches for the men that he would help and drive them to the job site in his van. And God. He was supported by his church with a monthly stipend of $100, but otherwise was not compensated for his generous volunteerism. In Korea, during Japanese occupation, while the imperial government was trying to erase any Korean identity, it did allow people to become Christian. Christianity became a form of Korean identity and was a way for people to congregate. Taken across the Pacific, Pastor Kim translated the need for congregation and community into a new land of different circumstances. Church became more than simply the sacred, but also served a secular need for service and a social center for a young and growing community. In the 60s, America's attention is again turned to a war in Asia. Just like the Korean War before, an Asian nation is split between North and South a leverage point between superpowers. As the Vietnam War escalates, Tae Hong Che is sent by the Korean military to South Vietnam to serve as a hand-to-hand -hand combat expert. Like John Im, Che was born in Korea in 1935 during the Japanese occupation. The family was very poor, and Che had to work as a paper boy in addition to attending school. After about 20 days of cleaning, Che was nearly ready to give up. It was then they told him that he had a good work ethic and it was time to start the training. Che learned quickly and earned his black belt after only two years. Taekwondo became a way of life for Che. By 1962, he'd won the Korean National Championship. Two years later, he goes to Vietnam to teach U.S. troops hand-to-hand -hand combat. After service in Vietnam, Che is sent to Washington, D.C. to train CIA and Secret Service agents. By 1972, as the Vietnam War draws to a close, Master Che and his family move to Oregon with $500. The family rents a cheap house in southeast Portland, sleeps on the floor, and eats from the one plate that they own. I had a 1954 Volkswagen, I buy $45 buy every day. My family push, you know, starting. That's why my ch children started thinking American car only push to get the started. During this trying time, Taehong Che turns to what he knows best.
Besides starting a Taekwondo 1972 in YMCA at time, no one recognized Taekwondo. No one in Taekwondo very knew. Kung Fu arrived with the Chinese at the turn of the century, and the Japanese brought over karate as early as the 20s. Master Che begins teaching at community colleges, holding demonstrations, and drawing more students into the Korean martial art of Taekwondo. To earn money in the summers, Che, like many immigrants to Oregon, picks berries. One day, in a strawberry field, he meets the Pak family. We understand they in Korean. We ask them, you are Korean? They're very surprised. Yeah, we Korean. We never see Korean people coming back up to strawberry. At the Pak farm, Harry and Rock Soon, or Rocky, as her friends call her, host large picnics and gatherings in their home. We're going to have a potluck, and everybody bring you a good thing to eat. People get together those days. The Pocks helped form the Korean Society of Oregon in 1967, and both volunteer terms as its president. To Rocky, born and raised in Korea, the reconnection to Korean food, activities, and students comes as a welcome addition. Following Korean tradition, Rocky's mother moves in with the family. To both women, it is important to preserve Korean ways and language in the home, but Harry, who is American-born, speaks no Korean. Raising their children splits the cultural gap wide open. My mother came here in 1956 and stayed with me for 36 years. She is a strictly Korean way of raising the kids, you know, what to say, whatever. And Harry is another way of an American way of. I was in the middle. I tried to please this husband, trying to please mother, and I was in the middle. And uh, it's not that simple. It was not that simple. Trying to navigate her role between her Korean mother and American husband, Rocky struggles as she sees her kids become more Americanized as they grow up. The pioneering efforts of the second wave in the 1960s and 70s firmly established the Korean-American community with churches, stores, and social organizations but it would take the next generation to face difficult, more abstract frontiers, forging a fine balance of Korean-American identity. A lot of Koreans that come here, they have college degrees, and they graduated college, and some even had great jobs in Korea, but they come here and it's not acknowledged, you know, it doesn't matter. Michelle Pock's parents immigrated to Oregon in the early 1980s to seek greater economic opportunity. Both of her parents worked, her father is a local businessman, and her mother started a dry cleaning business. Um, it's not the most glorifying job. It's a lot of hard work. Even if you do know the language, it's a lot of hard work, you know, just trying to please customers and producing quality, you know, work, but add on top of that, not knowing the language. If I just think about it, it's heartbreaking. She works 12, 13 hours a day, and she comes home, and I don't know what goes on during the day, but I see her come home and, like, she just starts to cry. As I got older and I kind of observed her at work, it was the most degrading thing like she could go through, like anyone could go through. Just because she can't pronounce a word or she doesn't understand, like her grammar is not perfect, like people will think she's, she doesn't understand what they're saying. It's so great to see how she's overcome that. And that's why I see her as my role model. I think it was more of a struggle for them to learn the language here and to understand American culture. As, but for me, it's um, trying to come to terms with the fact that 
I don't know if I'm Korean or if I'm American. I don't know, you know those Venn diagrams where like you're Korean and there's an American, and then the middle part where like you're a different category, right? Like, that's how I feel I am. Um, I just hope that they do know what's American, what's Korean, and they can choose the, the good things and mix together and better life. Yeah. The first generation of Korean immigrants face questions of immediate needs like food, rent, and education for their children. The sacrifices of the first generation allow the second a vantage point to ask broader, more abstract questions. Throughout history and my family's history, it was about the sacrifices leading to hope, hope for the future generation. My mother, I mean, her mother shares a lot of stories with her, and so then my mom shares stories with me, and so my mom shares stories about, like, my father's family, and so I feel like I get a wealth and just a wealth of information. Korean-American you know, even though I'm 26 years old, she always checks up on me and um, making sure I get home, you know, at a reasonable time. Or even if I come home late, she's always up waiting for me. And, and that's kind of the struggle, I think, you know, because my mom has grown up with a lot of restrictions in Korea. And, you know, her values are a little different. And, and mm -hmm. for me, growing up in the United States, it's like, well, my friend does this. Why can't I go out to or I just... I don't understand, and I know that sometimes growing up there was a lot of uh, kind of, you know, just a lot of clashes that way, definitely, because I am going to school with my friends and they're able to do whatever, but I'm not able to and not understanding. And um, how about the right now? Understanding me? <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> you know, I think my parents do try to kind of hold on, you know, to preserve, to kind of give us my brother and I, um, a glimpse of what it is to be Korean. And then I'm trying to, in a way, show them well how it's to be American. I just remember just growing up and hearing different stories from you know, my mom about her, the way she grew up. And I'm like, but mom, we're in the United States. I don't need to you know, follow those Korean traditions. <laughs> but as I'm getting older, I just realize how important um, that's kind of my, that is my identity, you know, being Korean American. Tony Kane was born to a Korean woman and an African American soldier stationed in Korea. After his tour of duty was over, Tony's dad left his wife and child and returned to the U.S. Tony's mother raised him as long as she could. We used to get beat up by, by the kids and things of that nature. The race is very important for Koreans because it, it's, it's a national identity for them. Korea has one race, really, it's, and they're Koreans. Um, and they're very proud of who they are. It's a very proud nation. My mother and I will go to a market or get in the bus and you get the stairs. Um, sometimes I wonder what if I weren't born, would she have gone through that? And what, what would her life be like? I think she felt a little bit ashamed um, to, uh, to seek her family's uh, the support. Um, I know she's a very proud and she's a very strong woman. Um, otherwise, she, she would have given me up as, as a baby. When I was 13, we decided that the, the adoption was way to go and I entered an orphanage um, at the age of 13 and I was adopted. Uh, I came to the United States when I was 14 years old. Put up for adoption as an early teen, Tony is now grown and married. He and his wife, Julie, plan for the family they want to start. Right now we're looking to adopt a child or two from Korea. 
While those first adopted from Korea were taught to assimilate, they will teach the next generation a different balance. We have the advantage that Tony is a Korean adoptee, as is his sister and brother. So the child we adopt will also have that background to refer to. If the child looks at me and says, you don't understand what I'm going through, I can tell them, call your aunt or talk to your dad, because they do. And I think having that will also help develop the child's sense of who they are. It would be nice to be able to sit down and hand them a book and say, here's all the answers. But they're going to have to go on their own journey. And through talking to others, through talking to us, they're going to have to develop their own sense of who they are. And we will provide them with whatever we can to help them on that journey. But much of it is going to be their own instigation and decisions. Yes, a lot of self-discovery. Yeah. Personally, it gives me an identity as a Korean because many Korean kids living in the United States, they lose their culture by kind of assimilating into American culture. So the reason I wanted to join this group was because I wanted to preserve my own culture and know who I really am as a Korean. So she explained that we have a little different of a style. It stands out and it's not the proper way, but it, um, it works for us. And I think we do stand out because we're not a bunch of old, older, I should say, Korean Americans coming together and continuing on the traditional Korean way. Korea and learn some, you know, from the prof professional um, drummer. And she was, she keeps saying like, my style is too fucking out there. I don't know, it's too much. Like you should, you should be really s stand and kind of quiet and like <laughs> all that. Yeah, but I can't. <laughs> now that what we're doing is more than just getting together and banging instruments, that it's, that it means a lot more to maybe the people that see us. A century has passed since Korean laborers first arrived to work the sugar fields of Hawaii. Now, at the 100-year mark of Korean immigration, the Korean community is thriving, celebrating their culture and place here in the United States. It is important to celebrate, you know, this 100-year Korean history in America because it shouldn't be lost, because it, it's a fabric of American society. 
it, it brings a peace to this whole American history, American story. Having memories, I mean, it's out of respect to our elders and our ancestors. Respecting them to know your culture and heritage. A generation maybe ahead uh, uh, who are older, they don't want to be reminded of things that were painful or hurtful. They want to look forward and not necessarily to look back. But it's necessary to remember that, both for the lessons it provides, but also to honor and respect and acknowledge the sacrifices that were made, both of a broader community, but of individuals. Today, the generations of Korean-American pioneers are busy at their daily lives while living in two worlds, honoring Korean ancestry and embracing American culture. John Him, the GI houseboy, whose father was killed for political reasons during the Korean War, is now a successful politician. Starting out, like many immigrants, working menial jobs such as painting houses, John M., a driven individual, has climbed the political ladder, serving as a state senator and president of the National Korean Society. But of all the plaques and awards on the wall of his mansion in Gresham, Oregon, he most proudly displays a small award for best grandpa. That's it. And Pastor Kim, the good shepherd who drove hundreds of his congregation to job sites, interviews, and the DMV, is retired now, though he is still doing good deeds and recognized in the community. Master Che, who earned his black belt at the age of 12, is still teaching the ancient art of Taekwondo to today's generation. Over the past 30 years, Master Che has trained more than 200,000 students in Taekwondo. In 1988, he took the first U.S. Taekwondo team to the Olympics in Seoul, Korea. Susan Cox, the 167th war orphan to come to the U.S. after the Korean War, is now a vice president at the adoption agency that first brought her and an entire generation of adoptees to America. A wonderful thing has emerged in the blending or the inclusion of adoptees within the Korean community. An acknowledgement that we are a part of that community in a, in a broader way is very affirming. And the forgotten war is not entirely forgotten. We think of the term, the forgotten war, is, uh, you know, euphemistic in the sense that it comes out of those of us who went, nobody knew we left. When we came back, nobody really knew we came back except our immediate families. And that was all right. We never worried too much about that. But the cost was pretty significant. Korea was one of the bloodiest wars that we have fought in many generations. For the short period of time that we were there, we lost more people than in most other wars. And the Park family is still on their farm in the shadow of Mount Hood, end of the Oregon Trail, 
and one of the first places Korean pioneers set their roots 100 years ago. The Korean-American story is as broad as a people, but at its heart, it is a story of family, of passing down through generations, holding firmly to roots, groundbreaking and toil, and a hope for the young.